patient hearing and I'm very um, it's an amazing program that you have and, and a wonderful uh, talk about the guidelines. Um, I have a very broad topic <laughs> that's basically the, the your entire program. I'll talk about um, and try and be complementary with the, the next talk that will focus on renal disease. And Ian DeBoer and I nicely worked together on the ADA guidelines a few years back. Um, uh, so it's a delight to to join everyone. Um, these are my disclosures that have research grants or consulting on advisory boards with all sorts of companies, many of which have the diabetes uh, medications, also a lot of lipid uh, related drugs. So lots of disclosures for me. Um, so just to start somewhere, <laughs> uh, we all know this. Um, but a nice summary slide where diabetes causes everything uh, and makes everything worse. Uh, cardiovascular disease is, is seen at a two to four times higher rate. I think with the new therapies, we're realizing that a big opportunity uh, for a reduction in heart failure, which turns out to be a very common component of diabetes, although for you know decades i've mostly thought of it as vascular issues uh with stroke and mi and and cardiovascular death and so you know it does take off about 8 years of lifespan um when looking uh you know at how long people with diabetes live versus without um, this is a nice uh summary of how patients present uh, with cardiovascular disease. And kind of interesting, so patients on the left don't have diabetes and on the right do. So there are many similarities, um, but standouts at the top of the list there are peripheral arterial disease, uh, where diabetes is a huge risk factor. Smoking is its other big risk factor. Um, but then heart failure is, is there as the very next thing. And then angina, MI, stroke, coronary disease, uh, you know, all the vascular events. But heart failure really is the second most common way that, that patients will first present with some type of cardiovascular disease. And so thankfully, we have therapies targeted at both uh, aspects. And so I think we just saw this, but this is from the guidelines. I think this is a new figure this year that is a wonderful, um, simple, but framework for all the different things that we need to think about in managing patients with diabetes. And so there are four pillars of areas that we think about, but you'll see on a foundation of lifestyle modification and diabetes education. And so the education part is, is key of explaining what is diabetes, what are the risks. You know, surveys have found that patients don't realize that cardiovascular disease, and as we'll come to in the next talk, renal disease are huge factors in the evolution of diabetes and really the, the complications. Uh, and so patients to understand that is really a first basic step that we're really trying to move their understanding beyond, oh, what's my glucose, to what's my glucose, my blood pressure, my cholesterol, oh, how are my kidneys, what else do I need to do to prevent, you know, heart attack and stroke, and, and so really educate patients about all the things that we have to worry about. Um, so then the, the pillars listed here are many of, of the basics, you know, glycemic management, blood pressure and lipids, but then this, you know, focus on the kidney, but also on cardiovascular outcomes and doing that sort of independently of the risk factors. So it's a, a little bit of a change in mindset where one has to think of, oh, I'm going to manage the risk factors, but then also think, are, am I getting my patients onto the therapies that are shown to prevent uh, cardiovascular and renal events? So uh, this is a slide a colleague did, uh, Mark Banaka, who's at the CPC Research Group in Colorado. And it's kind of daunting to see, but all these things are proven to help. So it's just 
amazing, basically. We we always think about diabetes, high risk, and uh, look at all the things that we have to offer that are now shown in large clinical trials to be of benefit. Um, and so um, we have to then take a few visits, really, to get people onto, or, or many visits, really, and an ongoing engagement with our patients to tackle each of these domains of management. And so uh, upper left blood pressure, that was the first, uh, you know, after glycemic control, the, the pillars, uh, and the diabetes is on the, on the right of managing the glycemic control, but then lipid modification, antithrombotic therapy, therapies focused on the kidneys, it's more than just ACE inhibitor and ARB now. Uh, so there are three other new classes of drugs that have been shown in, the, in just the last few years to be of benefit, and, and Ian will go through all those. But then same thing for heart failure, that uh, now at the top of this list is SGLT2 inhibition, uh, then some of the basics, but uh, you know, new data showing all of the benefits on heart failure. So this slide sort of becomes, and I think I've made it as my conclusion slide as well, of just a list of all the things that we have to remember and then look over each patient and say, are they on all these different things? And uh, the short answer is very few people are because there are so many things that we have to think about and offer. But what a wonderful time to be practicing medicine to have all these things to offer. And so I try and convey that optimism to patients to say that we have lots of good therapies to offer uh, and improve their outcomes. So uh, this is again from the guidelines that we just covered, um, but to show that there's a very nice algorithm. I think Ian DeBoer first published this as, as a extra thing and, uh, for the ADA, and then it's been a cornerstone of the, of the standard of care document, uh, making a very nice point that sometimes one has to start two agents if, if blood pressure is very poorly controlled, but then also to look at albuminuria and, and presence of, of coronary disease to start choosing and adapting which therapies uh, exist. And, and the part two of the figure I won't show, but um, you know, very nice algorithm that one can manage. So for lipids, I've listed here uh, the figure from the ESC and uh, EAS um, document. This is from 2019. It's the sort of the simplest uh, rendition of what I do in practice and, and I think is nicely evidence-based that we obviously start with statin therapy, get patients to their highest dose. So if they have documented disease, uh, you know, that you want to be on high dose statin. And then um, you check the LDL and see, is it at goal? And so for uh, primary prevention, we'll aim for an LDL less than 100 or, or uh, roughly 2.5 or 2.4, I guess, um, millimoles. Um, but then 1.8 millimoles or less than 70 for patients with atherosclerotic disease. So if one is not at that goal, then you add a zetamibe, recheck, and if not, then think about PCSK9 inhibition. So all of these are nicely evidence-based, and we have to walk through patients and, uh, and help them get to their goals. Beyond LDL, though, there's also a, a therapy now for patients who have high triglycerides, which is hugely prevalent in India, but now worldwide, certainly in the United States, it's becoming you know, a huge issue. And we now have an evidence-based therapy. And this is split out in, in patients um, who have diabetes, uh, who uh, also have high triglycerides, um, and adding icosapent ethyl, the EPA only omega-3 preparation at the higher dose of four grams a day shows a huge benefit both on first events, but the top curves you can see over a five-year period, patients with an LDL on average at 70 had 50% of them had cardiovascular events, and that could be reduced to less than 40% um, 
uh, and that's actually a cumulative number of events uh, per patient. So it's per hundred actually. Um, but in any case, a huge benefit with a therapy targeted at the high triglycerides. And so this is the concluding slide of my lipids talks, um, where this is how I practice, and I, I'm spending a lot of my time in, in, in lipid management now. Of, you know, with primary prevention, that same algorithm, usually just statins and azetamide there, targeting the LDL less than 100. One thing I've been doing more of is in patients who have a lower ASCVD risk score, but say high lipids, and they're not sure they want to start treatment, I've been doing a calcium score to see whether or not patients have atherosclerosis. And if so, then I push the target down to the ASCVD target of less than 70, and it becomes clearer for the patient that, oh, there's atherosclerosis starting, we have to really get you onto therapy and, and get things lower. For patients with statin intolerance, um, using uh, three times a week dosing of a half a pill of the smallest dose of rosuvastatin is a little trick that I found that I try that sometimes people who've had trouble with statins can tolerate what is about a 10th of a normal starting dose. Um, and then if not, move on to statins, PCSK9, bempidoic acid is also another option as well. And then as we just touched on the icosapent ethyl. So for antithrombotic therapy, um, the issue in primary prevention has been a hot topic. And, you know, guidelines in the United States and worldwide have been revised. In patients with diabetes, there's the very nice ASCEND trial that showed that there is a significant reduction in cardiovascular events by 12% when taking uh, low-dose aspirin for primary prevention. But it's balanced by an increase in bleeding. And so in absolute events, for every one cardiovascular death of my or stroke prevented, there's a major bleed created. And so it becomes a discussion with patients of whether they could tolerate it had they had bleeding issues before or GI issues. Um, you know, taking a proton pump inhibitor will decrease the bleeding risk by half. Um, and so it's a discussion there. I think without diabetes, in, and certainly in older patients, it's really no longer recommended uh, because there was no benefit in the ARRIVE trial. And then in secondary prevention, it's obviously a cornerstone of, of treatment that we do keep it. Sometimes we're adapting and dropping the second antiplatelet, but in patients with atherosclerosis or acute coronary syndromes, you basically follow the standard recommendations for dual antiplatelet therapy, et cetera. So on to uh, glycemic management or use of glycemic agents for cardiovascular management, as, as we would say. And this is a blow up of, of the figure that, you know, we've probably been seen like 10 times during this Congress. Um, but very nicely, and, and sorry, it's a little fuzzy, um, but the, the, the language has been very carefully crafted um, to say that first-line therapy depends on comorbidities, patient-centered management, and generally includes metformin. But you can see it softens that to acknowledge that in some cases, using other agents that are necessary for the other patient characteristics, such as atherosclerotic disease, heart failure, or CKD, might take a higher priority than starting with metformin. And so then the, the third, uh, you know, this red box uh, here says that the, the really the key management that I think we're all now starting to incorporate is to not just focus on the on the glucose, but to risk stratify patients into whether they have these other major comorbidities and then tailor the therapy accordingly. So then this is done really independently of the baseline hemoglobin A and C, their target, or whether or not patients are on metformin. So it really is a clinical diagnosis and then adding these indicated therapies. So for ASCVD, it's either the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors. 
For heart failure, really the benefits have been seen with SGLD2 inhibition. And then Ian will go through for CKD that SGLT2 is, is given preference, um, but GLP1 has benefit on albuminuria and the outcomes trial for CKD is, is pending. Uh, so we'll know more uh, coming up. So I'll go through the first two of these uh, segments. So nicely, um, when Ian and I were part of the group, there was a partnership with the American College of Cardiology that they published a, a parallel document that is displayed here that now is a figure 10.3 in the 2022 ADA guidelines. So that we're getting cardiology and the ADA totally in sync on how to approach uh, management of patients with diabetes. And the key thing right in the middle is that we address concurrently all of the optimizing of the various risk factors, including glucose, but then do this patient-specific targeting of the, the cardiovascular and renal benefit uh, for outcomes. And so we, we really do two thought processes to try and say, are they on the right preventive therapies? And am I managing all the, the, guy, the risk factors appropriately? So um, here, so the mechanism I think you've already covered in, in earlier in the day here, but you know the the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitions really is is still being understood. But you know lowers glucose and hemoglobin A1C. There's some weight reduction, but cardiovascular risk risk and renal progression is uh, is what's been seen and why we're pushing so hard. I think again, Ian may show, but the bottom right corner has been my takeaway out of all of these different factors, the effects in the glomerulus of unloading the uh, pressure inside the glomerulus is my simpleton's uh, understanding of how these are so powerful, but all of these different factors contribute to the benefit uh, that's been seen on both cardiac uh, and renal protection. So um, the clinical trial database in both of these classes of drugs, SGLT2 and GLP-1, is huge. We have like 22 trials, major outcomes trials now across the two uh, groups. I, I think it's 22. It's, it's amazing. This is a, a quick overview of four of the, tri the initial trials in ASCBD patients. And so what's been seen is basically benefit across these three different endpoints of major adverse cardiac events, cardiovascular death, and hospitalization for heart failure. The green are significant p-values and the yellow are trends, but you can see that there's a benefit seen on, you know, with lower hazard ratios on each of these. Um, and so it's really been a nice, consistent uh, finding. We did a, a formal meta-analysis of the first six of the, or five of the trials, I guess we included credence. And I think these numbers have, and, and percent benefit have largely held up when you add in more and more of the trials. So for major adverse cardiac events, it's about a 10% reduction in MACE that's been seen across the trials, largely consistent um, with them. For cardiovascular death, it's it's overall about a 15% uh, benefit. More benefit was seen in the first trial in Empereg and, and, and more moderate benefits seen in others, but it averages out to about a 15% reduction in cardiovascular death, highly significant. And so this is a therapy that's saving lives um, and, and a really nice thing to share with patients. So for the GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, also multiple mechanisms, and I'm not the person to speak to this. I'm still learning all of these things on this slide <laughs> and, and trying hard because this is a class of drugs that is having a, a terrific uh, benefit and, and is evolving with dual incretin uh, agents as well um, with uh, here, you know, slowing of gastric emptying, so more satiety, but then, you know, changes in the metabolism are my hand-waving understanding of how these agents have 
uh, wonderful benefits, but changes in lipid metabolism and reductions in inflammation. So as therapies are seen to be a benefit, we look back and understand all of their positive mechanisms for that. And there are many with this class of drugs. Um, this is a meta-analysis of the MACE outcomes. It was about a 14% reduction across the eight trials included here. So, and, and a nice consistency. So uh, really nice benefits seen on each of the different endpoints of cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. And so thoughts in, in some, uh, some people's minds to have a little bit more of a vascular effect um, and so, you know, better impact on MI and stroke with this uh, class of drugs. Um, Ian, again, we'll, we'll touch on the kidney outcomes, but a benefit seen mar most markedly on albuminuria, but, you know, wonderful findings there. There is not an effect that's been seen so far on heart failure with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So it's, you know, not significantly reduced, not surprisingly. And so the, the, that ACC AHA document had a nice table that helped us pick and choose. How would you choose if you have a high cardiovascular risk patient uh, between these two terrific new classes? And so I think the, the key for me are the, the, the second, third, and, and fourth lines where for heart failure patients or patients at risk of heart failure, the SGLT2 inhibitors really have a known uh, benefit. And in the next segment, I'll go through all of that. Weight loss is much bigger with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And so very often my patients are in desperate need of help. They've been trying diet and exercise and you know doing all they can and not really making as much headway as they would like. And so for those type patients, a GLP-1 receptor agonist could be really a wonderful way to add cardiovascular protection, but then also help them on their weight management. And again, for, for renal diseases, as, as will be covered, a little preference to the SGLT2. So I'll do a segment now about 10 or 12 slides on heart failure. And this has been really a, a revolution uh, in the last few years where suddenly we have multiple new drugs uh, that are available. So there's a new guideline uh, that was published this year from the American College of Cardiology, AHA, and Heart Failure Society of America. Um, where it talks about the different classes of drugs th that one can offer. And they put in a new um, staging where they have patients at risk for heart failure, so stage A. And so these are patients who have some of the risk factors, notably diabetes, as we just saw, as a risk factor to develop heart failure. You know, so a patient who's not had anything, um, but then stage B is the pre-heart failure where patients would fall into this category if they had documented low ejection fraction, but without heart failure symptoms um, or, you know, be, um, you know, cardiomyopathy patients or, or recent MI. Uh, so there the LV dysfunction, but without symptoms would be that stage B. And then stage C is symptomatic and, and stage D is markedly symptomatic. So here's the treatment algorithm where you can see um, five green boxes on the left as step one. And this is for managing uh, stages C and D, so symptomatic heart failure where um, you use diuretics as needed, the bottom one, but then there are the four pillars of, of therapy. And so it used to be ACE or ARB, but we now have the data showing um, uh, a, an ARNI or neprilysin inhibitor with ARB um, as superior to ACE uh, and ARB in different trials. So that's one pillar to try and get patients onto an ARNI. Then beta blockade especially for the low ejection fraction, a little bit less data for the preserved ejection fraction for beta blocker, but then mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and SGLT2 inhibition, the newest addition. 
And then as, as patients get onto those four pillars, there are other considerations in ICD or CRT, um, you know, resynchronization therapy, and then obviously uh, transplant if, if all else fails. But our focus is really on the left bar to try and get patients onto those four pillars of therapy. So some of the trial data to support this. So the use of a, an ARNI, Secubitril Valsartan, was seen to be better than enalapril in patients with HEF-REF in the first trial. A highly significant benefit, 20% uh, benefit. So most of my patients are on ACE or ARB, and then when I'm seeing them or if they land in the hospital, trying to get them onto ARNI, it's, it's usually a long process because the blood pressure, you know, is often low to begin with. Um, but, you know, this is definitely something we want to try and work on. Aldosterone antagonists, these are the three trials um, that have low ejection fractions or heart failure population from years ago, a post-MI with low ejection fraction, and again, um, the emphasis uh, trial as well. So, you know, clear, highly significant benefit of uh, MRAs. Um, so then for SGLT2 inhibition, um, the top part are from patients with atherosclerosis or the renal disease. The bottom are the, are the HEF-REF trials. A consistent, very interesting, about a 30% reduction in every single trial. It's the same benefit that's been seen, regardless of the patient population, whether you're stage B heart failure uh, or even stage A, which would be most of the top panel, or uh, stage C would be the bottom panel, the HEFREF patients. Um, so, you know, clear benefit uh, for the SGLT2 inhibition. One of the more recent trials has looked at this following an acute heart failure admission. So this is with sodiclofosin in the Soloist trial. You can see an immediate benefit starting within a week or two and an amazing benefit. So here are the data at, at one year, you only need to treat four patients with an SGLT2 inhibitor to prevent a, a cardiovascular death uh, or hospitalization uh, for heart failure or urgent heart failure visit. I mean, it's incredible. Um, it, I don't think there are many things in medicine that have a number needed to treat for one year of four. So this is the highest risk setting of a heart failure patient. We, you know, the, the stable atherosclerosis patients are at risk of developing heart failure. So there's really this full spectrum where there's always benefit of this class on heart failure. So a wonderful reminder that this is really a, a key therapy. So the issue is how do we get people onto all these treatments? And so the traditional sequencing is shown on the left that actually is on the basis of sort of a chronologic uh, series of when were these therapies shown to be beneficial in clinical trials with ACE or ARB as, as step one. Um, and um, I should mention my dad was actually part of the very first Cactopril trial in, in heart failure um, many years ago. Um, but anyway, then beta blockade is a cornerstone of, of uh, heart failure treatment from, again, 20, 30 year ago trials. Then we looked at the, the data for MRAs, and then the most recent comparison for the neprilysin ARB, and then the SGLT2. So that would be a traditional, oh, I've got to get them on the basics and then start adding the new therapies. But we're realizing we need to rearrange that order. And um, you know, many people are on a beta blocker, and this is especially for HEF-REF, where beta blockade is important. It's it's really less, you know, there there are very few data in HEF-PEF about beta blockade, but the others apply. Um, but SGLT2 inhibition, we just saw, has almost an immediate effect. It's very easy to start with, you know, very few issues. You check the creatinine to make sure it's, there's not a huge detrimental effect, but there very uh, infrequently is. Then, you know, converting over ACE or ARB to the neprilysin inhibitor is could be a second step. And these aren't cast and sewn, uh, but then an MRA might be the, the final step. So 
the SGLT2, because it's easy and has a big and early effect, is something that could move up in our thinking of how do we try and get patients onto the different four pillars of therapy. And there are some trials now starting up of how do we do this and what's the sequence? And, and it's an area that's really difficult. And when I'm on service, it's really hard to get people onto all four, you know, for a hospitalized patient uh, because of, you know, hypotension or renal disease, uh, et cetera. So uh, here are the data in HEF-PEF. So again, with the ARNI as compared with an ARB in this setting, a, um, a benefit was seen on total hospitalizations uh, for heart failure or cardiovascular death, and this was approved uh, by the FDA for use. So really a, a, a benefit that's been seen largely across the full spectrum when they've analyzed the fully normal ejection fraction of above 60, it's, it's sometimes a little bit of a question mark of was, whether there's added benefit, but certainly everything from uh, basically normal to any reduction, there's a clear benefit of converting over to the ARNI. Um, these are data from the HEFPEF trial that's been done with spironolactone. Uh, overall, a non-significant finding, but a benefit on hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, and then, you know, they had issues with probably inappropriate patients in, enrolled in, in Russia. And so when you set those aside, it, it's beneficial. So this is likely a beneficial therapy, uh, but the data are just sort of medium strength, I would say. There are, um, there's a new trial in HEFPEF with finerenone that's, uh, that's just getting started. And so we'll have more data with this general class uh, coming soon. And speaking of uh, finerenone, I think Ian will speak more about this, um, that this is one of the two trials that, you know, was focused on could this new um, MRA agent prevent progression to renal failure. But in the middle, you'll see that cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, and hospitalization for heart failure, they're all uh, reduced as well. So very similar findings as we've seen with the SGLT2, but with an MRA. And so more data coming in the heart failure setting but certainly a benefit seen on cardiovascular outcomes in a largely, you know, kidney disease, which overlaps with ASCVD in a, in a big, big way. And so that was added into the guidelines as well, more from the renal uh, endpoint. And so uh, these are the data for SGLT2 inhibition in the two uh, dedicated HEFPEF trials. We have the published data from Preserved and we'll have uh, we've had announcements um, on the DELIVER trial, but similar uh, benefits seen. So really that same story that regardless of the patient population, the SGLT2 in inhibitors prevent uh, heart failure, or in this case, CV death or heart failure. And a final reminder that for heart failure management, just as for atherosclerosis and diabetes, that we do have to remember all the non-pharmacologic components of this. And so dietary counseling and patient education, physical activity, emphasis on compliance is, is huge and, and good follow-up. You know, thinking about other uh, things like sleep disorders, um, uh, and you know thrombotic risk. So there's lots of other things to think about uh, in our heart failure patients and, and especially in those with diabetes. So final data slide, how are we doing? And answer not so hot. <laughs> Um, this was a lipid registry that Mikhail Kosobora and I uh, helped uh, lead, where we looked at lipid therapies, but then this was a focus on the patients with, everyone had ASCVD who also had diabetes, and then we looked at the use of SGLT2 inhibition. This is about uh, data from this snapshot was three years ago, but, you know, just uh, eight or nine percent of patients with ASCVD diabetes, we're getting the proven therapies. And so quite low. And then when you start adding up all the different things, we have a long way to go. And so I again come back to my very exciting list of all these wonderful therapies that we try and work with patients to get onto. And it really is a 
takes a while to optimize all of their treatments, but each one of them will provide uh, benefit to them. So thank you very much for your attention.